we are going to now turn to uh, the second uh, letter to Timothy, and it's the first seven verses. I'm just getting a little approval there. Yes, it is. And that's Second Timothy chapter one, one to seven. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace and mercy, or grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers day and night, and night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, that faith dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Amen. Thank God now. <coughs> Are we just starting uh, the second letter uh, to Timothy? What you'll find is Paul is in prison in Rome, a dark, dingy, wet, rat-infested prison in Rome, and he's on death row. He's been sentenced to be executed, to have his head removed from his body. And so he takes a pen to uh, write to tell you, he probably dictated this actually uh, to either Luke or Mark, who was with him. He writes it and he says, This promise of life, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. You can just imagine how he's feeling. That he's going to be dead soon. But his hope is in the promise of life. So he writes this to Timothy, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, by the promise of life in Christ Jesus. How are you feeling this morning? You know, the older I get, the closer I get to death. Now, I get into trouble a lot about this. But the, the hope that I have is in the promise of life. So death holds no fear. How are you feeling this morning? We Jack, there is just a young man. Death is far off. Right at some time in the future, with all your life to live in front of you. But we may, it's hours, days, weeks, months. Maybe a couple of years left. Death will come to us all. And so, where is your hope? Is your hope in the promise of life? I guess death will focus our minds on just what we've done for Jesus. Or rather, what have we allowed Jesus to do through us? So if you want to do a, a wee inventory on your life and, and work out, has Jesus used you for the furtherance of his kingdom? Has, the, has Jesus used you to bring the gospel to a lost world? Do you know and have experienced Jesus Christ in your lives? Because that's the gold, the precious stones, and the things that we take in to eternity. But I guess as life goes by, it sort of focuses that in our own minds. My advice to you young men and women is 
go flat out for Jesus now. Go flat out for Jesus now. And to be used of him for his glory. And then when you get old, you will know that you've stored up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. But Paul starts this uh, letter to Timothy, like many more. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's an immediate declaration that he is an apostle according to the will of God. Not according to his own ambition or according to man's choice. Paul had a role to play. And we have a role to play. His role was being a unique ambassador for God to the world. But what's your role here on earth? What are you called to do here on earth? And have you got the courageous enthusiasm to do it? When I was looking at this uh, passage at the beginning of uh, 2 Timothy, I've entitled it, Have We Got Courageous Enthusiasm for What God Has Called Us to Do? To fan into flame the gift of God. Everyone has their own role to play. And we must each fulfill it by the will of God. In fact, the church will not function if each of its members aren't functioning. For we are the church. It's when we come together as one body with all the gifts and we use those gifts or we allow Jesus to use those gifts together do we start to function properly for the furtherance of the kingdom. You see, 2 Timothy is not only the last letter we have from Paul, but there's also a note of urgency and passion that we might expect from a man who is about to be executed. Is there passion? Is there urgency? Is, that, is there that courageous enthusiasm in our lives as we go about serving? the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to look at four things this morning, briefly. Paul's love, Paul's prayer, Paul's confidence, and Paul's encouragement. He says in verses 1 and 2, To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. God the deposit entrusted to you. Now it's interesting that uh, Paul uses this phrase, phrase, grace, mercy and peace. And Spurgeon picked up on this uh, along with 1 Timothy 1 and 2 and Titus 1 and 4 to show that ministers need more mercy than others do. Paul only wrote grace and peace in his greetings to the Romans uh, the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, the Philipp Philippians, Colossians, and Thessalonians. But in the pastoral epistles, he adds in the word mercy, grace, mercy, and peace. He was compelled to greet them with this mercy. And Spurgeon has this to say. Did you ever notice this one thing? Christian ministers need even more mercy than other people. Mercy is required to cover our shortcomings. I need mercy more than any of you. So I take it from my Lord, my Lord's loving hand, and will trust and not be afraid, despite all my shortcomings and feebleness and blunders and mistakes in the course of my whole ministry. You see, there's a high standard expected of ministers. They need to be even more aware of their failings and willing to share them publicly as an example. 
And that requires courage. Courage to be vulnerable and not just pay lip service to it. You see, vul vulnerability is a great measure, is an exact measure of courage. It's not weakness. Vulnerability is knowing you are loved even when you mess up. And that gives you courage. And Paul prays in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscious, conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. What, what an encouragement for Timothy to know that the great apostle prayed for him. You see, Paul knew Timothy's weaknesses and problems and therefore was able to pray for him specifically and with a real burden on his heart. His prayers weren't out of a routine, but compassion and concern. Paul is to be admired for wanting to do the most for Jesus he could whenever, wherever he was. If he couldn't preach, then he would pray. What does your prayer life look like? Who are you praying for knowing their weaknesses and their problems? You see, there's power in prayer. When men work, they work. But when men pray, God works. Paul's confidence in Timothy in verses 4 and 5, As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and then your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. Paul didn't think that Timothy's tears were evidence of failure or insincerity or a sign of weakness. We need to understand that men feel that weakness brings shame and women feel that they have to do it all and have feelings of not being enough and that brings shame. And to deal with shame we need to be wholehearted for God. Timothy's faith was sincere and genuine. He was wholehearted for God. And this filled Paul with joy. It made Paul genuinely happy to remember the faith of faithful men like Timothy, who loved and served the Lord Jesus and his people. You see, Timothy came from uh, the city of Lystra, and uh, there uh, Tim, Paul met Timothy as a young man who had just come to Jesus, who was devoted to serving the Lord. And he is described as having a mother who believed, but a father who was a Greek. So Timothy's uh, mother and grandmother were believers and led him to Jesus and grounded him in the faith. God wants to use parents and grandparents to pass on eternal an eternal legacy to their children and their grandchildren. What are you doing? That's good. <laughs> what are you doing with your children and your grandchildren? Are you telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you reading the Bible with them? Are you encouraging them to come to know the faith that is in Christ Jesus? Are you being an example to them of how to live in Christ Jesus? And that's what Lois and Eunice did with Timothy. And when Paul left Lystra, he took Timothy with him. You find that in Acts 16. And this was the beginning of a mentoring relationship that would change the whole world. Are you 
being mentored? Are you mentoring someone? And if not, you need to ask God to provide someone for you. You see, we're not in this alone. We're not isolated on our own. We need someone to come alongside and to walk with us and to talk with us and to help us and give us direction, to correct us and to administer and to minister to us. But you know, it's this picture of uh, running the relay race with the baton. Who are you passing the baton of faith onto that they would take hold of it and run <clears throat> with it? It's important that we seek to mentor others, the older ladies should be mentoring the younger ladies, and so on, the older men, the younger men, to take on the baton and to run the race. Who has God given you to mentor? Who has God given to mentor you? I would urge you, if you haven't got anyone, to seek them out and to work with them. It has to be a God-given mentor, not somebody that's appointed to you. And you'll know them when you meet them. It wasn't enough that this genuine faith was in Timothy's grandmother and mother. It also had to be in Timothy. Our children must have their own relationship with Jesus. You can't get saved through your parents. You have to accept Jesus for yourself. You need to trust in Jesus for yourself. The phrase genuine faith is a believing faith. It's a trusting faith. It's real and not just an appearance. Have we got real faith? in Jesus Christ and are we exercising that faith when was the last time you cried out to the Lord Jesus Christ and you know he answered you by faith there is no greater feeling of that relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ as when you pray seeking and then he answers through circumstances through people through a change whatever it is and you know that that is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking into your heart speaking into your life I don't know if any of you have uh, watched the film Faith Like Potatoes if you haven't I'd recommend it it's a true story of Angus uh, Buchan. He was a white uh, Zim Zimbabwean <coughs> farmer uh, with a Scottish origin with Angus Buchan. You could guess he was got Scottish origins. And he'd left uh, Zimbabwe and uh, to escape the political unrest and the land reforms that were heading their way. And so he headed south to South Africa to start afresh and all he had was a trailer and his family with him and when they settled in the new land it was tough it was very difficult for them and they really struggled he faced ever mounting challenges hardships and personal turmoil and he quickly spiraled down into a life consumed by anger fear and destruction but finally his wife convinced him to attend the local church where he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ his outlook then takes a complete turnaround and supernatural occurrences begin to happen when he starts to pray by faith he was traditionally a maize and a cattle farmer 
but then he decided to plant potatoes. But the scientists and all the other farmers said he was mad because they were in a drought. And unless they had irrigation, the crop would fail. But he placed everything into this crop, believing that the Lord was leading him. He planted the potatoes in the dusty ground and all the other farmers thought he was mad. But when the harvest time comes, there's a crop of giant potatoes. It was a miracle. He got the courageous enthusiasm to pray, believing. When we have faith and act on it, God will come through for us, no matter our circumstances. Have you got that courageous enthusiasm to step out in faith, knowing what God has called you to do. There is always fear attached to faith. Because we don't see, we have to take a step into something we don't know for sure. And therefore, fear comes in to say, what happens if it falls flat on its face? I'm sure Angus had those problems when he put the potatoes in a dusty ground. There must have been something nibbling at him all the time to say, you're going to lose everything. You've put everything into this dusty ground. And if the crop fails, you fail. You're destitute. You lose everything. You lose the farm. You lose everything. You're right into it, into the banks, and they will just repossess you. And so in, in light of that fear, he has courage enough to believe that it is God who's called him to do this. It's God who's asking him to do this. It's God who's going to provide. He's putting his whole trust, he's putting his family, he's putting his home, he's putting his farm into the trust of the Lord Jesus Christ. That takes courage. Without the fear, there is no courage. And that's why we get frightened and turn away from taking that step in faith. Because our whole being is screaming out to us, you're going to fail, you're going to mess up, it's not going to work. And yet when we put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll come through. Paul encouraged Timothy, for this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Timothy was indeed gifted. He was a, a valuable man for the kingdom of God. But he seems to have had a timid streak in him. And Paul often encourages him to be strong and courageous, to be enthusiastic. And, and the word courageous comes from the French, cure, meaning heart. And it really means wholehearted. And when we see things as God and me, then we're wholehearted. The problem comes in when we see it as me and God, then we're half-hearted. Because it's about me using God for my purposes. When we're wholehearted, it's always God and me. God is doing and he's using me. God is fulfilling his purposes through me. God is sovereign. I am not. God is all powerful and I am not. I am nothing without God. But when it's me and God, it's God, would you help me do this? God, would you provide for me in this? 
God, would you give me a better job? God. <laughs> God, would you come with me? <laughs> See, it's about me. And you're fitting God into me. And then, of course, if we don't know God at all, then it's just me. It's just me. And then we have no heart for God at all. In fact, we don't know God at all. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to be wholehearted for God. It's God and me. He wants to develop within Timothy this courageous enthusiasm necessary to lead and protect his flock. You know, in 1st and 2nd Timothy, there are no less than 25 different places where Paul encourages Timothy to be bold and not to shy away from confrontation, to stand up where he needs to stand up and be strong. Because of who Timothy was and the responsibilities he had to bear, this is what Timothy needed to hear. Is that what you need to hear this morning? Do you need to hear that God wants you to be wholehearted for Him and to be courageous and enthusiastic about what He's called you to do? Are you building treasures in heaven? Many come from the place where they need to hear this. Stir up the gift of God which is in you. Stir up the gift of God which is in you. God has placed a gift or many gifts in you. My question this morning my question this morning is, do you know the gift that God has given you? Do you? Yeah. Well, stir it up then. <laughs> A lot of us go through our Christian lives yeah. never really knowing what that gift is. And how can we stir it up if we don't know what it is? That's why it's important to have a mentor. Because a mentor will help you to recognize what your gift is. And he'll or she will encourage you in stirring up that gift. Yeah, you know. And what's God saying to you? What's God saying to you? He's saying, stir up that gift that is within you. You see, God doesn't work his gifts through us as if we were puppets. He leaves an element that needs the co co cooperation of our will, our desire and our drive to fulfill the purpose of his gifts. Some wait passively for God to use them but God is waiting for them to stir up the gift that is within them. Some wait for some dramatic new anointing from God. And God is waiting for them to stir up what he has already given them. I hope and pray that you know the gift that God has given you. And I hope and pray that you stir up that gift so that it can be used of God. And, and, and this word stirring up 
it has got this connotation of when you've lit, have anybody been camping and you've lit a fire? You've got the fire, fire going and, and you've, got, you've got your kindling there and you, you've just got the beginnings of a few flames coming up and you're trying to get it going. And, and what you do is you, you blow on it to get the embers to really burn brightly and then it catches. It's that idea of stirring it up. It's like blowing on the fire to get it to burst into flames. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, so, and so the gift of God that's within you, you need to pay attention to it and you need to blow on it to encourage it to burst into flame so that, it, that everybody knows what your gift is because you're using it to God's glory because he's, he's, he's getting a roaring fire going that everybody can see. And then you're using it for God. You see, what Paul was doing, he was laying hands on Timothy to acknowledge that gift. That was it. He wasn't, he wasn't instilling the gift in him because God had already done that. He was acknowledging the gift that was in Timothy by laying hands on him. You see, it's a good thing to have others pray for us and that we might use the gifts to bless and build up the family of God. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We need to remember that when we're called for this courage, this courageous enthusiasm to step out in faith, then when the fear comes, we need to deal with that. And this is really what Paul's telling Timothy. We all face situations where we feel timid and afraid. Some it's for speaking out in front of others. I remember when I first preached in front of a full church, uh, I was very fearful and uh, very timid. I couldn't stop my bottom lip from shaking. Others are afraid of confrontation. Others are being made uh, to look foolish. Others are afraid of rejection. We all deal with fear. But fear is the flip side of courage. If you didn't fear, you couldn't be courageous. So the first step of dealing with such fears is to understand that they are not from God. It isn't God making me feel like this. God hasn't given me this. That's so important to realize that when you feel fear, it's not coming from God. It's coming from some other place. And the second step in dealing with fear is to understand what God has given us He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. When we do his work, proclaim his word, represent his kingdom, we have his power supporting us. We are in safe hands. God has given us the spirit of love. And this tells us a lot about the power he has given us. And many pe people think that power in terms of control. But Jesus' power is expressed in how much we can love and serve others. Paul wrote to Timothy because courage matters. Without it, we cannot fulfill God's purpose in our lives. You see, God's purpose for us is not for us to be making money to building our pension funds, uh, to be entertained, or, or even to be comfortable. It's for us to use the gifts that he's given us to touch his people and help a needy world. Fear and timidity will keep us from using the God, gifts God has given us. God wants us to take his power, his love, his self-control 
and overcome fear? Have you got the courageous enthusiasm to do what God has called you to do? Have you got the courageous enthusiasm to step out in faith, knowing that God will be there to help you fulfill his purposes and his plans? That's what Paul's saying to Timothy. Timothy, my boy, I've got a big task for you. Have you got the courage yeah. to be used to God in a very powerful way? Or does fear stop you in your tracks? And see that day when we come into the glory, when our time is up here on earth, what are we going to say to Jesus? Are we going to say it was too difficult, Jesus? I was too scared, Jesus. I was full of fear, Jesus. I couldn't do it, Jesus. I was nothing, Jesus. And when he turns around and he looks at you and he goes, but Rod, I just asked you to be a vessel for me. I was going to do it all through you. All you had to do is have the courage to stand out and let me do it. And I would fill your mouth. I would empower you. I would love through you. I would do all these things through you. You had to overcome the fear to have the courage. That's what you had to do. Yeah. So take this opportunity to turn to the Lord Jesus. Commit your life to him. And then see what he does through your life. Powerful. Powerful. We can only miss out on it if we're full of fear and trepidation. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word this morning. May it be a word in season. May each person gathered here this morning know your presence. Know what it is to know you intimately. To know the call that you've placed and the gift that you've placed within them. And Lord, may they know the courage of allowing you to fan the flame of that gift into action. And may people recognize that it's all of you and not of us. That it's God and me, not me and God, or just me. And so Lord, bless us this morning and keep us in your protection. Lift us and give us that courage to step forward in faith, believing, just as Agnes Buckham believed and you came in and came through for him to give him a mighty crop because he had courageous faith in you. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.